Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the Lake Forest Park City Council special meeting for Thursday, March 7th, 2024 to order. And at this time, uh, Mr. Goldman, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Sure. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilmember. Colleagues, we have a few folks that are going to be here in a few minutes, uh, but the, in the interest of expediting the meeting, um, we're going to move on. Do I hear a motion for adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or any items that need to be pulled from the consent calendar? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The eyes have it. Thank you, Council. And with that, we're moving on to uh, public comments. And I'm going to read the quick blurb here. Public comments. This portion of the agenda is set aside for the public to address the Council on agenda items or any other topic the Council might have purview or control over. If the comments are of a nature that the Council does not have influence or control over, then the Mayor may request the Speaker suspend their comments. Council may direct staff to follow up on items brought up uh, <clears throat> brought up by the public. Comments are limited to a three minute time limit. Thank you, Ross, I appreciate that. Uh, is Scribble here? No, there's, there's no one <laughs> <that listed. laughs> Thank you. Uh, Matt, do we have anybody out in on the internet that would like to make public comment? Uh, if you wanna address the council, please use the raise hand function. Hey. Doesn't look like it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. With that, we'll close public comment. Okay, we're moving on tonight. We have some great presentations coming up. And beginning with, uh, Mark is going to prevent, present to us the Planning Commission work plan, or introduce it, I should say. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director. Uh, this year, as you know, we're uh, underway on a significant effort for the periodic update of the comprehensive plan. It's a two-year effort, 2023 and 2024. The second year is significantly uh, heavier lift. Um, but what you'll see in your packet is a work plan reflective of last year, 2023, at the commission. What it consists of is generally January through June working through the individual elements of the comprehensive plan and creating a review draft uh, for later consideration by the city council. What you'll hear later tonight is a climate element, an amendment uh, due in 2025. So with those two primary tasks, the work plan for this year is comp plan, comp plan, comp plan. And then where we could find gaps, we will fill with development code beginning with critical areas, ordinance, shoreline management plan, signs, uh, wireless, anything that uh, we could achieve in the gaps in between. So primarily it's a simple work plan for a very diff difficult effort. Thank you. Director Hoffman, thank you very much. Colleagues, questions for Director Hoffman? It is a very full schedule and I know that Mark and the team are <laughs> Working very hard, and and Mark, as I mentioned in the meeting the other day, I I'm so pleased that other cities are more scared than we are. So I do appreciate your it's effort. Good not to be the most scared. <laughs> Alex, any questions for Director Hoffman? No. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, we're moving on to um, Corey Roche is going to introduce the Climate Action Committee work plan, and. Chair Phillips as well. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Phillips. I live at 1853 26th Avenue Northeast in Lake Forest Park. Um, and I'm here to report on the Climate Action Committee's plan for the next year. And it's a little bit, and there's a little bit of um, flexibility in our plan, but we're going to present you what we think is what we're doing. The first is that we're um, we're 
current re currently reviewing the climate action plan and we will I, I think I've come to you before and said it's just around the corner but I really actually believe it's around the corner we've been working with a consultant to um, smooth it out and to introduce some graphics that we think will be helpful and also to do an equity review the climate committee just didn't feel comfortable with our ability to do that and uh, we're having somebody else look at that the the complete uh, document should be done um, uh, March uh, 29th, and then we'll go back and look at it one more time as a, a whole committee, and then we'd like to bring it to you and uh, have have a chance to chat with you about that. Um, so the, we're also then beginning to do some pivots that we wanted to talk about. We are going to develop a set of legislation for you. That is what we saw coming out of our comp, uh, out of the climate action plan, which we thought um, would be uh, kinds of uh, ordinances and resolutions that the council should take. And we're gonna we've developed a list, and now we're trying to find model ordinances from other jurisdictions to look at what kinds of things uh, uh, heat pumps in new construction that is a sort of an example of one of those, but some of them are um, you know, a resolution to add a fiscal note to everything you do, uh, instead of a fiscal note, a climate note. I'm sure you will love that. So we were thinking about things like that. And those of course would come to you for your, for you. We're also um, spending some significant time um, coordinating with the planning commission, which turns out um, a little bit more difficult than we thought because we we had sort of an idea in mind about how we were going to do that. And now we're going to do it in a different way. But um, what we're going to be doing is taking the kinds of issues that we have, and and um, because of the grant that's coming forward, instead of having a climate element, we're going to take the elements in the climate action plan and integrate them into the existing elements for now. And then, um, so we, we've had help from a consultant, but um, the, the committee is really working very hard this month to do that review ourselves to make sure that, you know, every insight we have is <laughs> integrated into the comprehensive plan. Um, and then we're spending um, some significant time, uh, we think the next phase is outreach to the public. Um, once we've talked with the council, um, we're doing some outreach to the public and that has, um, you know, we have a book club. Um, we've, this is our second book that we've read. We're trying to work with the library to um, sort of see if they would take that over. Um, our notion is, is as many ways as possible to integrate the conversations about, con about uh, climate into as many places as we possibly can. And that's sort of the notion about what we want to do as we move forward is to have conversations about climate. How is it that we can engage in a way that isn't, you know, hostile or anxiety producing, um, but sort of engaging with people and having conversations. So we do a lot of tabling. Um, we're gonna table at the Green Fair, the farmer's market, um, and that notion of engaging in conversations to, um, there's, there are changes coming, and no matter how much um, you don't want it to happen, it's gonna happen, so we need to have those conversations. Um, so and then we're so we're planning a couple of things. We have set up a town hall meeting on climate for the first legislative district, and our senator and two representatives are coming to third place commons, and the other cities in the district are um, have indicated some interest. Kenmore is co-sponsoring it with us, um, and working on flyers and um, and uh, being really helpful. And um, we've talked with Kenmore. I mean. Kirkland and Woodenville and Bothell to see if they want to sort of join in. Um, and uh, we're talking about other kinds of things we can do. Um, so we keep running into issues around recycling that people are think is ours. So we think we ought to do something about recycling. Um, you go into the commons and you can't figure out what to do with your coffee cup, right? And the pictures don't match what we have. But sort of that happens in my household as well. We're talking about um, uh, David Berge, who you may know has done a lot of uh, natural history with the, the native history of, um, of this area, has just finished a, a pre-publication on the prehistory uh, of the native people in Lake Forest Park. And we'd like to sort of present that as a piece. Um, and then we're thinking about doing an electric uh, vehicle show where people bring their own electric vehicles. So you can talk to your neighbor about their electric vehicle and not a sales rep. Um, but those are still sort of in the 
those are ways we think we can have conversations. Um, and um, let's see, uh, I think that's it. That's what we're, so that's the pivot we're taking, we think we'll be taking, but we're very excited to bring you the, uh, the plan. We, the, the, I just have to say, this is an absolutely remarkable group of people that you put together. Um, uh, they're very smart and very hardworking and um, have really made a commitment to this. And, and we are a lucky city indeed to have this level of people showing up in these committees. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Colleagues, questions for Ms. Phillips or Ms. Roche? I didn't. Oh, can you hear me? Please. I just, I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you, Sarah, for for coming to speak with us tonight. I know you work really hard. You put in a lot of time and effort. This is very passion. It's obvious you have a passion for the climate and the climate committee. And um, I really appreciate everything you're saying. I take it um, very seriously, personally. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or comments? Apologies, my voice is. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Corey. I think you're uh, staying right where you are. Thank you. And the next we have the um, see, wait, uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board Work Plan. Thank you. And I'm Tyler Dittman. Tyler, here. yeah. Welcome, Tyler. Sorry. Here. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tyler Dittman. Uh, I'm supposed to give my address, 19224 25th Avenue Northeast in Lake Forest Park. Uh, I'm the chair of the Parks and Rec Advisory Board for the city. Uh, I have two parts for you tonight. One is to talk about our uh, 2024 work plan, which I think you have a copy of. And the other is to talk about a, um, a memo that I just or we just sent to you about uh, some open design questions on the new park. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the work plan, if that's okay with you. Uh, as in the last few years, we have a work plan that kind of goes through five general categories of things that we're working on. Uh, but as you can imagine, the first one on the list is kind of taking up a lot of our time and attention, which is the um, the park master plan, in particular working on uh, the the all the work around the, the new lakefront property. Uh, so we continue to work on with that with our consultants and uh, connect with the community when we can at the different uh, design sessions and uh, other community meetings on our own. Uh, we're also trying to increase our Park social media presence. Uh, we have some ideas for that. It's it's kind of low scale at this point, just like just describing the parks one at a time in various posts, just to kind of stir up a little uh, a little interest in them when we can. Uh, the next is to increase just our just use of the parks by the community. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had a I think really successful yoga in the parks uh, mm -hmm. on uh, summer Saturday mornings. Uh, we hope to continue that this summer. Uh, it is really a fair weather activity, however, uh, so we're looking at other things to do throughout the rest of the year. Uh, we are looking for other community participation options for us as a board, uh, particularly in the parks or with recreation. Uh, we had a re really good, uh, just as an example, a really good uh, connection with the Shore Lake Arts group, uh, looking at holding yet another event in one of our city parks, uh, probably over the summer. Uh, and then just generally, we are uh, we're open and hoping to connect with all the different, uh, the council and other uh, advisory groups to the council on parks issues. So in, in, uh, including the uh, Climate Action Committee and uh, Tree Board, things like that. That's the plan for the year. Tyler, thanks. Questions for Mr. Dittman. Very important work. I know you're working very yeah. hard, a lot on your plates. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah. What takers? I I just got confirmation that our colleagues are going to be joining us shortly. So <laughs> people are running a little bit late today. Uh, many thanks. Really appreciate okay, the work. You. And you're staying right there, right? You have a next update. Yes, up, I have another update. thing. <laughs> <laughs> is it part, uh, yeah, I'm up, next on my list. Please, please. Uh, is to, I think, I think you've received the, the memo we wrote about, uh, there are some design options that were open kind of consideration uh, regarding the new lakefront property. And we just want to give you our, our take on those. So we wrote them up in a, uh, a few pages. Uh, we, we do have the consultants on the project uh, coming to speak next or later this evening. So I, I won't go into too much of the detail, but we did walk through a few of the kind of big, not big, op open issues that had some good options uh, in them. Uh, generally concerning the amount of parking to have in the park, uh, the the design of the, um, the, the changes to the Lion Creek Preserve uh, not not fundamental changes, but just like th things that can change the 
the the vibe in the park was kind of how I think of it. And uh, how much how to think about the beach area in that park, uh, and then what the what a play area should be and what that should look like, and what the dock should look like. There were a few options for each of those things. Um, I think you all have the memo. I won't go too deep into it, but I will say that the parking one is a it's a complicated one, I think, and it has a lot of discussion around it. In general, we we our view is let's keep parking to a minimum. It's never going to be enough in that small park for the for the busiest days. So let's keep it to a minimum. Um, but that minimum needs to include accessible spaces. Uh, needs to include some uh, un, plenty of I think load and un unload for, to use the park well uh, for for equipment for watercraft for people and picnic supplies things like that uh, as well as a few spaces. I think that the number is still to be determined. Uh, connected with use of the building that will remain there, either for people who have rented it or staff who are using it or something like that. So while we say minimal, we don't mean like one spot. We mean enough to make it useful, um, but not really any general use parking that people can just drive into the park and hunt for. Um, because given the size of the park, we think they will be hunting more often than they will be succeeding in parking. Um, I'm happy to talk about that further. Um, for the beach, for the Lion Creek Preserve, we think the meadow view of it would be um, would be really interesting, a nice change for other aspects of the city's parks. Uh, the other option was more of the forested version, which I think we have a lot of. Um, and all of that is assuming that the, the health of the creek is the primary consideration in that. So I think that's built into this, this design. Um, for the beach option, we had two options to think about, the all beach or the lots of beach with a dedicated uh, watercraft launching. This is human powered watercraft, no, not, nothing bigger, of course. Um, on balance, we recommend the all beach option at this point. We think that's the main point of the park for the community. Um, and uh, jumping ahead to the dock options, we think the dock option of the, the larger dock with more spaces in it uh, really does provide uh, more opportunity for the city residents to, to connect uh, with the lake uh, and also provides a watercraft launching. So that those two combined, I think, will be a good solution uh, for the play area. Oh, sorry, uh, for the shelter. Uh, not a lot of detail on this one. Generally, community support was uh, was against the more not against, but not in favor of the more ornate, uh, bigger, com more complicated design. And we agree, like something smaller is sufficient to get our, our needs met there. Um, or the play area, uh, the the design the. The options given were all sort of a version of na natural looking play areas, but the, the so we went with the one that's called uh, nature inspired. Uh, so it looks kind of neat, uh, but the the key feature that we got from a lot of community feedback was let's make it a real play area, uh, not just like a few logs stacked up. Uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, involved in that uh, later parts of the design to make sure that that is really meeting the community's need, which is they want a real play area that kids can play in. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, or we can get to some of the other designs with the, with the consultants. Yeah. Colleagues, any questions for Mr. Dittman, recognizing that we have a full presentation from uh, GGC Watershed? Thoughts? Questions? Hmm. Oh, yes, please, uh, Councilman Hulbert. Uh, not so much a question, but um, I really appreciated in the memo that you tried to bring in what the Parks Board's thoughts were, but also what the community survey feedback was and yeah. trying to merge those together. So I appreciated that balanced approach. Yes, you're welcome. We, we really tried to focus on uh, all the, the survey results, the, the all the comments that came with it. We read through all of them and tried to balance them. They, were, of course, didn't 100% line up, but we tried to balance it and find the 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 patterns that were in those comments. So we, we took that very seriously. Thank you, Councilman. Colleagues, other questions? I did, before you go, I just want to step away from the podium. I just wanted to, to highlight something uh, and commend you all for all the Planning Commission, the CAC, and yourselves for coordinating uh, how these things intersect together. Uh, that is enormous and um, the, the lack of siloing, whatever we would call that, the lack of uh, the, the considerable coordination, I think is commendable. I mean, it really is essential and uh, for the success for all these different initiatives. So thank you for that, yep. all of you. Um, thank you. And then I guess we'll move on to the actual Great. poll update. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. No problem. Everyone, everyone had a little bit of confusion about the time tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> but others made it. So, yeah. 
It's, it's not daylight savings time. Just say thank you. Welcome. Not yet. Uh, thanks <laughs> both the CAC and the Park Board because they really were out in the community all year. Yeah. PTAs and Rotaries and I, both the both the groups. It's great. Thank you. Well, welcome. Okay. Please. Bruce Amber back from DCG Watershed to do the update of where we kind of are on the concept plan. We'll wait for Pat real quick. <laughs> Okay, um, so again, uh, thank you to the council um, for having me today for this update. I'm excited to present on some of the progress and to build on uh, what Tyler introduced in terms of community um, thoughts and recommendations. Oops. We'll delay on this. Okay, so just a quick step through. Uh, the last time that I presented to the council was November 9th. Um, at that point, we had completed pre-design. We were moving into the conceptual design exercises, including design programming, which is uh, looking through the community's feedback, looking through the feedback and direction that we received both from the council, from other stakeholders, um, from some early communication with the tribes, as well as um, the assessments that were done on the property. So figuring out what would be acceptable uses, what are in line with the values and feedback that had been shared with us, and then developing those into some uh, alternatives. Concept design uh, really runs through to January where we went through looking at those uh, designs, coming up with feasibility analysis, looked at permitting, cost estimation, moved into alternatives analysis, which is where we are now. So we have uh, development and presentation of the alternatives. There is some refinement that will happen and then the selection of preferred design. So preferred design, we have a target at the end of this month. Um, uh, here I am to the council today. <laughs> That's part of that um, right in that stage of the project. Next, we'll move to schematic design. That uh, once schematic design is concluded, which is the end of our, our current contract, um, we do have subsequent phases expected with early works demolition. Um, that will be some demolition work that I'll uh, provide a little bit more information on later in the presentation and then design development. So in terms of design programming, the specific things that we completed were evaluation of the initial survey data of community input. Um, we did a thorough analysis of regulatory and site information, looked at our grant requirements and then the city's feedback. And we identified a potential program of park uh, activities and uses and facilities. So when we talk about a program of uses, we might think of something generally like swimming rather than how the swimming is uh, provided. So the activity would be swimming. We know that this is something that's really required from the grant water access. And we also understand that swimming is something that the community spoke very, very specifically about. Um, swimming as a site use on a use with a water uh, shoreline would be, of course, in the lake. Um, and then some facilities that would be necessary or appropriate to account with that would be things like uh, staging for beach areas. So is it a bathhouse, a changing room, um, restrooms, obviously certain things re are required, uh, washing of bodies, that's that type of thing. So we work from this general program and then start listing off these things that are going to be necessary for the enjoyment of those uses. So then we go through a process of uh, exploring what the implementation of that looks like. How do those things play on the site where we have especially site constraints, which on this site we have a lot. We have existing structures, some of which will stay, some of which are required to, to come down. We have a lot of trees that need protected, not just from the tree trunk itself, but all the way out to the root zone, which, which uh, guides our placement of appropriate uses within the site. We go through an exercise of basically design, vet, redesign, so we'll say, wouldn't this be a great idea? And then we need to try to disprove it or support it for as long as it works. And then once we find regulation or site constraint or some other um, additional site programming that compromises that, then we go back and we refine. So we do this for weeks uh, in a, a you know collaborative internal charrette. And when we start to see things that emerge, the more ideas that we can go through and not choose the better ideas we have that emerge. And so what we come up with is really a consensus of all of the ideas and charretting that we went through in that process. So the goal is that, you know, refining to a strong array of feasible options. Um, when we bring concepts to uh, the city or to the community, if we bring something that doesn't meet your goals, meet your values, isn't born out of the information that we collected early on in the process, it's not a feasible good option. So we would never bring something that, uh, fails some success metric that we were given early on, because then we've really given you a false choice in terms of the options that we're presenting. So once we go through, you know, 
by golly, I think we have it from a, an option standpoint, we put all that to uh, cost review. So we get realistic early planning level cost estimates, which is going to be essential information for the community and for the city to make decisions. But it also provides us with information about cost management. So if we know that something in the early planning level exercise could cost X, we can say, okay, well, maybe it costs X and we have X minus 10% for funding. Where are the ways that we can cost manage? Um, an example of this is the dock. So for example, we sized the dock at, a, I think, 12 feet wide. Um, what we learned in our cost pricing is that regardless of surfacing, regardless of pilings, regardless of support structure, the single biggest driver of dock cost is square footage. So by just saying we have a 12 foot wide dock, if we cost manage that down to 10, we have uh, lost 20% of the cost. So fantastic in terms of giving us flexibility as we refine these options forward to figure out what funding we received, what funding is available and what funding will support. So by knowing what we have in the design options, we can start to target different fund, uh, funding mechanisms, which I know is something that is really critical for this project. So for example, the dock being uh, a water access facility is eligible for a lot of other grants. So we may not have to move that 12 feet down to 10, because there may be funding that we can target specifically that'll fund the full dock in its um, initial uh, conception. Okay, so um, we in, in the alternatives analysis stage, which is where we are, um, we presented the alternatives. We can, um, did this through both an in-person and an online open house. Um, we're continuing to engage with the community through those things. So we pushed social media, email, and postcard updates to uh, alert people that this information was available for them to see, review, and participate in. We did a presentation of the design options to the PRAB, um, and we presented prior to that an overview to city staff. So this was a, a pretty long meeting with the, the Parks and Rec Board. Um, went through a lot of information, much more detailed than we went through with the community, um, but giving them the chance to really ask questions, understand the design thoroughly before they were presented to the community so that they could act in their role as liaisons to the community to answer questions and to provide more information, being that they had that special um, forum to get really in-depth into the information. So the community workshop, uh, this was um, happened at the end of February and, oops, Okay, uh, to get people coming to the workshop, we have a very involved community. We've had great um, you know, attendance at all things around this park. So I wanted to share some of the metrics about that. The last time I met with the council, we had 780 unique visitors to the website. Um, by when I started this presentation at early in the week, we were at 2,500 unique visitors. So more than a 300, you know, 300% 300 of that initial um, amount. Uh, we now have 172 individuals on the listserv. That's about doubled from the 96 that we had previously. Um, our postcard mailings, that was 4,733 direct mailings to homes in Lake Forest Park. Um, then that was a once in the pre-design stage and one in this stage. Um, E-news, there's a citywide distribution. We've been coordinating with Corey and with E-news to make sure that there's posts that go out in that. And then the engagement surveys for the project. So the pre-design survey, we had 496 responses. Um, then after we did workshop one, we put up basically a survey that went through all the workshop one content for anybody who could not attend in person. Um, we had seven responses to that survey. And then for workshop two, we had attendance of about 100. We had an additional 181 responses um, on the survey. So uh, the in terms of our presentation to the Parks and Rec Board, we did have full attendance. We participated in some interactive exercises to debut some of the exercises that we would bring to the public. Um, and I did provide a summary of the discussion um, with the Parks and Rec Board from that early amount that's on the project website. And I believe it was provided to the council after that meeting, I think. Um, the Parks and Rec Board, I think, met two additional times uh, post that meeting um, and came up to a consensus on their preferred design on the 28th. We published preliminary uh, results for the community survey, I think two or three times, and were sending those to Corey as they were coming in to make sure that the Parks and Rec Board, through their deliberations, was seeing what the community sentiment was. And then the uh, Parks and Rec Board sent a memo to you guys yesterday um, with their uh, recommendation written down. So the community workshop, we had 87 participants sign in, but we estimated about 100 attending. And as mentioned, 181 responses on that survey, which was open from the day before the workshop through to yesterday. 
Okay, so the Parks and Rec Board meeting, I won't spend a tremendous amount of time um, in terms of what those recommendations are. Uh, Tyler presented what the individual choices are for each of the option areas that we presented. And so this is what that recommendation based on the PRAB uh, looks like. So we showed a handful of example plans um, earlier on to the council. We talked through the community meeting about, um, or not to the council, but to the Parks and Rec Board. Um, through the community meeting, through the online survey, we showed, you know, these are the different option areas. These can work like puzzle pieces and they can be put together in multiple different iterations. We talked about how the, you know, cost guidance on the park was somewhere between uh, Log Boom and Tualities as a, these are near us and similar to, to our condition. So we don't know how much this would cost, but if we're in that range, maybe we're in the right range. So we did some cost exercises based on all of those options pulled together. What is the lowest cost option going to cost and what is the highest cost option? So in terms of what this option um, is, it's right in that range. And I'll spend a little bit more time on the cost as we get through the community's recommendation as well. So the second presentation, the second, you know, really group presentation of the design options was the community workshop. As mentioned, we had a lot of people show up. We had really good engagement, lots of great discussion. Um, the room was busy and buzzing from the very beginning to the very end of the workshop. We had this exercise allowing people to play with different tiles for the diff different design options and then open comment. So we did direct everyone to take the survey and we allowed them open comment on each of those um, design design options. So if we missed anything, please tell us. We're still early in the process. None of this is set in stone. Okay, so the polling on the design options from the public. Um, I'll go through the same option areas that Tyler went through with the PRAB's recommendation. And you can see where these align with the PRAB's recommendation as well. So the community had a preference for more parking um, rather than the minimal parking scenario, but they shared some of the very similar sentiments that Tyler shared, which are that loading and unloading are going to be critical. We had uh, open comments that were no parking, please provide no parking to we need a lot more parking, a lot more parking than you've shown. So there were definitely, you know, lots of discussion around this. The main things that people kept repeating were things like, um, what are the logistics of this being a water access park, uh, you know, operational limitations about um, parking behaviors and things like that should be implemented as part of how the park is managed. So for example, you know, are there timed parking spaces? Is it permit only? Is it staff only? That operationally parking should be provided, but we should make sure that behaviors like parking to get on the Burke Gilman are curbed to the extent possible. Um, lots of people mentioned just encouraging travel by walking, biking, and transit. And so making sure that there is a safe connection from the park to the Burke Gilman Trail and to the, uh, the crossing intersection being essential. And then a lot of people also mentioned the safety and logistics of um, crossing from City Hall. Uh, so we know that there are recommendations that were made um, early on in this project that we provided for improvements to that intersection, but that those are on a separate track in terms of being part of the city's coordination with um, the other highway projects that are, are happening. Um, so as far as the preserve, the preserve planting, um, one of the things that the commission, the council was very specific about early on was uh, how the preserve was cared for as part of this project and um, likely the need for mitigation as part of some of the development of the shoreline properties that were recently acquired. So one thing about the preserve is that it does provide us because of some of the invasive issues that are there and the presence of some trails that are pretty close to the creek. If we can find a way to do some restoration of that, um, then that provides us with mitigation that can allow us to make, do some of the other improvements that are on the north parcel. So what we have in the park, um, in the preserve property, are uh, is a small park space. It's a it's a community preserve that has faced uh, development pressures for recreational use that um, have been partially relieved by the city's acquisition of the two parcels to the north. So when it was the only place to get to the creek and get to the shoreline, there were more trails than perhaps the creek buffer should handle. And so now by relaxing a little bit away from the creek, we can actually control more of the, more of the development, more of the recreational uh, uses centered on the three properties together, give the creek a little bit of space and address some of the, um, the restoration issues that are present. So for example, there are lots of great trees in the park. They provide critical essential shade to the creek. Um, under no circumstances would any of those be removed, but there are areas where there's the central trail that gets kind of mucky when that floodplain is activated. 
Um, that's got a lot of compacted gravel in it. So currently that's functioning as a paved surface. And then um, there's lots of invasive species through that whole center corridor. So in that area, the mitigation action could be restoring that trail connection and replanting that area after the removal of invasives. We would then have the option to either keep it more open like it is today, or to plant it with trees, which is how the condition was before the floodplain restoration work happened um, back you know, earlier in 2014, 2015. Okay. Um, so that was the question that we posed to the public was assuming the restoration will happen within this park, would you like more of that, uh, you know, restore the forest or would you like us to keep more of an open meadow? So what we heard from everyone is whatever is best for the creek is what we want. And if they're the same, we have a slight preference for the meadow. But the community was also very specific about um, maintenance as being a key driver in terms of, you know, any sort of replanting that we do is going to be need to be maintained just like the first plantings were. So um, if we can plan for a maintenance program that's right sized for the city, that's a smart play. So in terms of the beach, there is uh, a preference for a larger beach to a smaller beach with uh, which with a launch area. Um, lots of uh, respondents to the survey commented on the value of a separate launch. So in terms of keeping some separation between paddlecraft users and between beach users, and just mentioning that, you know, if people are dragging their, their paddle boats, is it something that's damaging the lawn? So there's definitely a not a lot that we need to think of. We can still provide the giant, you know, beach area, the biggest beach that we can get in the um, space of the property. And then there can be operational limitations, a sign that says kayakers this way or kayakers off the dock. So there are definitely ways that you can address the community's concern of keeping a little bit of separation between beach and beach users and swimmers and paddlers through an operational uh, fix that doesn't affect the construction. We did have a higher cost associated with the dedicated soft launch than the larger beach area. Um, that also aligns with the Parks and Rec Board recommendation, as does the next one. So we provided basically three approaches to the redesign of the lakefront shelter which was that we can say, this is gonna be the front door sculpture piece when you're looking from the lake back at the park, does this become a real icon of you know park picnic shelter construction with a higher cost? Or do we go you know all the way simple, simple, make it just effective and efficient? Or do we look for somewhere in the middle where if we can add some style and flair at a reasonable cost that isn't going overboard, then you know what would be what would be the community's choice and what's their palette for investment versus return on the fix to the structure. So what we heard was that balance. Now this was um, close to simple, so there was it was either balanced or simple. Uh, Forty-eight point nine versus forty-one, and then the showpiece uh, option scored very low at nine percent. So what people mentioned mostly was you know what are the uses and amenities that are included. Um, they wanted something nice. They wanted something beautiful. They wanted something that felt like it was from Lake Forest Park. Um, the covered space for both shade and rain. And then all of these other things, running water, seating, you know, place to plug in a crock pot, um, those types of things as being things that we should consider. And then um, art integration was also mentioned. So that it may be a way where we can look at a way that ornamentation can be part of the structure without it being part of necessarily the construction. If there's art funding or something like that, where we can look at engaging an artist um, to uh, provide some uniqueness to the structure itself. So the playground, we got lots and lots of comments about the playground. Um, I would have to say that I feel like this is my fault because I purposefully selected three images that showed a similar activity, but just different construction. And um, those made the playground look less exciting than we intended to be. So my apologies for that. Um, so everyone said that a playground is very needed and a playground works well with this type of other uses that will be in the park, being at a beach, family activities, family gathering, events. And so uh, a playground that is right sized for the space where we have the playground um, set, it has open sight lines from both the beach area and from the deck of the large house. Um, it also is underneath two canopy trees, which would allow us to save by not needing a sunscreen structure over it. Um, so basically, it sounds like the community is asking for the best structure that we can get that will fit in that space and still accomplish these other things of not conflicting with tree roots where trees would have to come down, not con conflicting with overhead limbs where those would have to come down. Um, but there's lots of options. And one of the great things about play structures is once you identify what you're looking for in terms of the look, 
There are lots of grants and vendor grants, either from vendors or from other suppliers that um, can help to play for playground equipment. So just by knowing we want something that looks a little bit like this gives us the ability to start to target some of those funding opportunities for funding the, the playground specifically. Um, what we also heard was that, you know, the playground isn't shouldn't be all of it. There should be opportunities for nature play and engagement throughout the park. Um, one great idea that actually came from a young man at one of the tables was um, one of the tables during the public meeting was that he wanted to do a search and find and to do a search and find uh, through the playground. But we had actually thought it would be great after doing the interpret uh, interpretive plan to do a search and find basically throughout the whole park. So have these little, you know, Easter eggs that you find throughout the park that um, call out flora and fauna, these really specific nature engagements that came out of um, the research that went into the interpretive plan. It tends to be a low cost option of giving something really great that allows you to notice something a little bit different each time you go. So to the extent that we can continue to add those things, so these other layers of play to get people you know, at the playground, but then also away from it, I think um, can be incorporated into the design cost effectively as we as we move forward. So there is a slight preference for the all activity dock at 51% over the modest dock at 48%. Um, but the community was very close on these things. So nearly divided. If we would have kept the survey up for you know, a week longer, they may have evened out exactly. Um, more of the question that we heard was about the appropriateness of uses that again, would be operationally allowed or not allowed on the dock. So uh, watercraft, is this a motorized or non-motorized park? Fishing, is fishing allowed? Is fishing not allowed? Um, and then a number of comments mentioned a delineation of the swimming area or containment of the swimming area, um, which can be done through buoys or other things, or again, through operational limitations like signage. Okay, so some of the recurring themes that we heard from the community feedback. So this is outside of really the questions of saying, you know, pick one. This is the uh, more substantive, you know, feedback that we received. So the uh, prioritization of environmental protection, preservation, and restoration is a key, key driver. Lots of the community commented on this, even when they would say, we need more parking, but it needs to be sustainable. You know, we need a bigger parking area, but it should be made of recycled materials. So we heard this over and over again as part of really, you know, a, a critical ethos that's important to this community and should play into every single um, aspect of the park's construction. Providing a robust playground. Um, multiple activities, uh, multiple, um, a wide range of things and make it accessible if we can or as accessible as possible. Um, designing for uh, minimizing maintenance. So really thinking about the long-term operating cost of the park and the park's uses and activities as uh, a component of the park design. Accommodating a wide array of rec recreational activities. The nice thing about passive recreation spaces like this is that when you think active recreation, you think tennis court. So it's one facility for one activity that serves maybe four people at a time. A passive activity park like this, we can basically say, you know, here is a healthy, nice space where you can decide the activities. Is it a game of catch? Is it a picnic? Is it, you know, a family reunion? What are the types of things that you do here? So by programming less and building a little bit less and making it more flexible, we're actually accommodating a, accommodating a wider array of potential uses that can hopefully grow with the community as the community's recreational trends and needs change. Um, so the next thing was uh, concerns about parking capacity and logistics. So this is a long comment here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a, lots of people thinking about, you know, how is this going to work? We're aware of the issues on Beach Drive. We're aware of the issues with the Civic Club parking. Um, you know. Yes, there is parking at City Hall currently for the preserve that a lot of people don't use. So we really need to spend some time both thinking about how this is going to work, uh, phasing the improvements in the construction to make sure that things like the safe crossing, the sidewalk, the additional uh, crosswalk are present at the opening of the park. So if there is a phasing plan, which we anticipate exploring in depth as we move forward in the design, um, making sure that the stage is set and people are comfortable with how we're directing most of the access of the park. And then the last being cost is a concern. So we had a number of people mention, uh, you know, that this park seems like it's going to cost a lot. We had some people say, you know, spare no expense. So we've been waiting for this park for a long time. Um, but what it means is that the, the community is tuned into the conversation about cost. They will be tuned into the conversation about funding and fundraising. And so to the extent that um, we want to have an honest, authentic conversation with them, making sure that, you know, we are being upfront about areas for cost management, when cost management actions can be taken and what the cost of those will be. 
Um, and then of course, as part of cost, maintenance and operational uh, cost should be considered. So here is the design based on the community polling, which aligns with the Parks and Rec Board recommendation. So we have two recommendations from the community liaisons and the representatives to oversee the you know, um, park system in Lake Forest Park. And then from community members who engaged with this process and who participated in things like the survey, um, the alignment of those two things. Okay, so some of the synthesis of those design recommendations. Um, design options were selected. Uh, so th those two agree, the PRAB and the community. Um, they Things were picked from both the higher cost and the lower cost uh, column. So we didn't have a let's pick the lowest cost thing whenever we're given the option or let's pick the higher cost. This is great because we're getting a sense of what the community's value is in terms of what's ROI to the citizens of Lake Forest Park. And so in the selection of some of these activities where they're saying, yes, this one costs more, this one costs less, you know, what will you pick? So we had both sides of that coin. So as mentioned, we did the early pricing exercise, which I think had us somewhere between like 5.9 and 8.7, I think, million. Um, based on the community's recommendations and the PRAB's recommendations at this point, pulling from the information um, from the early cost estimate, we're at a rough cost of $7.65 million. And that is a construction, a burdened construction cost, uh, not representing owner's cost, which I'll go into just a second from now. Um, and that is forecasted out to $2026. So that is in line with those two uh, brackets. Now, those two brackets were paid for before, so we did escalate their costs up to $20, $26. And so um, the, the cost of the 2023, I think, cost of Tualatin was in like the six something million, but forecasted out to 2026. It actually puts it at 8.9. Okay. Um, so some other feedback that we received, both from the community and from the Parks and Rec Board, will be really critical in terms of how we refine the design moving forward. We got a great comment today about how the design team hadn't thought about pervious pavements, um, and we have. We just didn't want to spend too much money on geotechnical borings. So we wanted to figure out where the pavements would go. And then the beginning of the next phase, we'll do geotechnical assessments to determine if previous pavements are feasible, which hopefully they are. And then, um, then you know, specifically what comes next and what that feedback will inform, things like cost management, with, which I've mentioned, what are the details and specifications of actually how the park comes together and is constructed, and then refinements, which will be inevitable, you know, to tweak uh, geometry and dimensions and things like that as we move the design plans forward. So here's that statement of, about uh, the relative cost of this project with others. So we're basically, you know, right in that range of where we were hoping to be with a lot of room as the design moves forward to manage cost. So this uh, $7.65 million is based on that early pre-design or that early concept alternatives ROM pricing. So rough order of magnitude planning level cost from our cost consultant. And um, that does include a 20% contingency, because we don't know. It is escalated to $2026. They did estimate that owner costs, so these are things like um, uh, design costs, engineering costs, permitting, sales tax, permit fees, jurisdictional fees, inspections, that all of those could represent an additional 40% on the construction cost number. And so that actually puts us at a construction plus owner's costs of uh, $10.7 million. So what we should know is that is $10.7 million as the all in in 2026 dollars. Now the city has already spent $300,000 on some of the current work. So that would actually come off of that 10.7 in 2023 dollars. So there is a little bit of playing with this math in terms of how we get to. We also have, um, the city has $270,000 from RCO for selective demolition of some of the structures, that is $2023, which would also come off of that 10.7, and that's grant funded money that would be spent this year. So as we are moving this project forward, the total all-in cost is being slowly accounted for in the investments that the city is making today to reduce that cost of what the $2026 would be for doing it later. Okay, so um, we once we get through this we have selected the preferred design. The, the city council has decided that, you know, this is the plan that will move forward. We'll immediately go into refining that design down a notch, thinking a little bit more about materials, providing that back to the cost estimator consultant and getting a repricing, not based on us saying, oh, these are the prices you gave us before and that rounds out to this, but actually getting a full new cost package based on the preferred design. 
Okay, um, this is very small text, my apologies. This is actually our permitting, uh, our permitting and feasibility study um, based on what some of those options are. I put this in here mainly so that we would have it as a, if you guys had questions about permitting, we could refer back to it, but that's here. So I'm just gonna skip over it and go to um, questions and discussion. Do you want me to pull up the permitting information? Let me know. And then also if it, doesn't bother the council. I would love to take notes on my laptop, but I can take them by hand if you think the typing is going to be distracting. That's fine. Go ahead. That's fine. Council questions. <laughs> council Member Lebo. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's exciting to see how far we've come and what we can envision as the final product. Um, question for you is about the engagement with our um, tribes and our native uh, peoples. And how have they been brought along in this process? Sure. Um, oh, sorry. Do I have to wait to be recognized? No, please go right ahead. I apologize. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So um, we have been sending just a, you know, here is what the process is looking like. Here's where we are in the process. This is a general update. This is how you can provide feedback. And we've been providing those emails to both um, representatives of the Snoqualmie tribe and representatives of the Muckleshoot tribe since the, the um, project began. So we have gotten on occasion an email back, you know, hey, this is interesting. Can you follow up? Can you send some information? Um, they have at times wanted to, you know, look at the community engagement material before it goes out. They provided some great feedback on care for the preserve, on things that will be uh, things that are likely to come up as potential concerns when we make an application and that application is provided to um, any tribal representatives as uh, preferential commenters. So that's been great in terms of getting that feedback early and making sure that that's in, incorporated into the process. Um, we have uh, been thanked by, by both tribes for just continuing to send them updates and allowing them to participate and provide feedback on their schedule and how they want to. Um, as the design is moving forward, we have definitely been hearing a little bit more about, you know, have you thought about this? Um, let us know when you have design drawings. So it sounds like what we have done in this first stage is establish a solid uh, degree of trust and open communication that I think is going to serve us very well in terms of refining this design to when we make applications. So uh, do we have, um, you know, uh, early approvals, no, <laughs> but we do have open communication and um, a good relationship. So I think that's an excellent start. And the fact that the tribes have commended, uh, you know, the effort that the city has made to be proactive with the communication, I think is very strong. Thank you. Thank you, council member. <laughs> council member, good. Gosh. You've done a great job at outreach. It's at a very thorough presentation. I really appreciate all the facts you put in there. I am wondering, have you done any engagement with the people that live on that street? Because it, that process is probably going to be interruptive to them. And they're going to be affected long term, probably by whatever traffic of people there are. We have. We have done uh, two direct engagement meetings with um, representatives of Beach Drive and residents of Beach Drive. Uh, one was a slightly larger group, I think about 30 residents. Is that right? Something like that. Um, and we, you know, we sat, we took questions, there was open discussion, there was uh, very candid expressions of concerns about, you know, what their um, ideas were and getting that early in the process and allowing us to respond with the expertise that we have on the team is great. So we do have a traffic engineer as part of the design team who we thought you know, this is a project where we're going to need really specific traffic engineering. And what we essentially did is, you know, when we first started talking about this project, we understood that uh, with the preserve being part of the project and the preserve parking already being located at City Hall and with the city administration really feeling like, you know, no matter what, there's going to be a degree of parking that's provided at City Hall, either as overflow or as the main parking for the project, that the project uh, exploration needed to encompass that whole area. So both Beach Drive, those three properties and the intersection all the way across. Mm -hmm. What we heard by doing that was that our consultant analyzed the intersection. And then when we heard from the Beach Drive residents that queuing on Beach Drive because of the signal timing was a 
was a problem and that that was further complicated by the U-turn action through the intersection mm -hmm. and then by people trying to get to the current preserved property, that all of these things work together. And so we had our traffic, our traffic consultant be able to say, you know, yes, if we can work with WashDOT to allow U-turns, that'll help. If we can work with them to change the signal timing, that'll also help with the queuing. And if we can establish things like a one-way entry to the park that pulls people off of Beach Drive while they're waiting for unload and unload or unload and unload, then um, we'll be in a better circumstance to plan all these things together and hopefully address these within the scale of what's possible in this project. So that's another thing. So we do know, you know, there are boundaries to what we can accomplish with this park project. And I think in providing the Beach Drive residents with uh, an open channel to contact Corey with comments for the design team to look at those and to provide a conversation back. Again, we have open communication. So if there is a concern that arises, hopefully we get it early rather than when, you know, the final plan is ready to be implemented. And then we have a, a dozen people show up to protest the adoption of the plan um, at the end. So the hope is that as these critical things become apparent, whether it's uh, certain stakeholders in the community or kind of a one-off comment that somebody has as an idea that they think should be important to this park, um, we want them to share it early and often because now is the time where we have the most flexibility and control to make sure that those things are accommodated in the design work. Or we have plenty of time to have a conversation about why that's outside the scope of the current work but can maybe be addressed through some other means. So one more thing. So right now you're waiting for them to reach out to you with any other questions they may have, or are you planning to do further outreach to them just so they are kept in the loop along the way? Sure. So we have a listserv that allows people to opt in to project updates. Mm -hmm. We also did do specific outreach to get as many Beach Drive residents kind of in the room um, when we had that earlier meeting mm -hmm. and then have accepted one of the Beach Drive residents asked if we wanted to walk the entire course of Beach mm -hmm. Drive and look at not just the immediate vicinity of the park property, but really think about how some of the conditions later down the road feed into this problem mm -hmm. or these concerns. And so we have taken them up on those opportunities. So it's been a mix of you know, outreach to them and then accepting invites for communication back to us that I hope would continue through the second stage of the project as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, you. other questions? Council Member Goldman. Um, yes, so thanks. Good. And apologies if I missed this. Um, at what stage in the process will there be feedback and refinement for the uh, what happens to the buildings, to the cabins, the big house, uh, that sort of thing? Sure. So we provided um, a number of options of how we could look at modifications to the interior of the structures and then how the structures could be reused. So this was something that we, um, our architect did develop different options, looked at uh, draft demolition plans, and we discussed this specifically with uh, the Parks and Rec Board about one, what those potential options are. Um, if you'd like, I can go into those a little bit more and talk about some of the, some of the differences. Um, but what came out of those discussions and what came out of the engagement with city staff and the engagement with um, the Parks and Rec Board was that this will be an operational uh, you know, task managed by the city and that the, de the decision about the programming of the interior structure was less within the purview of the city's decision or of the community member's decision based on the actual construction because they weighed in heavily on what the use of the, the building would be. And that use was accepted by the commission or the council. So um, a way about thinking about this is when we heard from the community, you know, uh, almost 500 responses and at the first community workshop, how should these structures be reused? What we heard was we need a picnic shelter. We need a picnic shelter. The lakefront shelter is perfect for that. What we heard about the middle building. So the big house was that, um, civic space, community space, space for community activities was uh, really needed. And that that was something that everybody was supportive of. We also heard things like, oh, maybe you could rent out the cabins. Maybe before they're torn down, you could rent out the cabins. Now that would be an operational choice that the council could decide to do, um, but it would be outside of the design scope and the construction scope of this project because it's an operational thing that would happen prior to the park being constructed. Now, when it comes to the demolition of some of these structures, that's actually, uh, you know, the grant requires their demolition. And so we don't, again, we don't have a choice for the community members to weigh in on whether those structures stay or go. And where we did have the choice about cabin six, so this is the um, smallest cabin uh, right adjacent to the garage in the center of the property. Um, I can provide, I can flip back to the sketches if that's helpful, um, but, uh, Basically, we provided parking options that allowed either for the keeping of that structure 
or for the demolition of that structure. And what we heard from the city was that office space was also needed. And what we heard from the community was that there should be eyes on this park all the time. As long as it's open, someone should be here. And so thinking about how cabin six, which is um, the northmost, so the page left building, mm -hmm. the tiny one, um, that uh, what could that be used as to support both of those things? So the discussion was, well, if it's kept and it's an office, could it be a place where there is a groundskeeper? Maybe it's a community policing officer. So this satisfies the community's request for eyes on the park and for a presence while also providing much needed office space for the city's operations. So we saw this as, again, something that was a win-win a in terms of how the program could work but really ultimately was the city's decision about whether the long-term operations of this park will be improved and better facilitated by the keeping of cabin six and the stationing of staff there. So the garage, which is the central structure, uh, this is a garage that appears to have been constructed as a brick house. So it has a bathroom in the corner of it, but then it was added onto and like hollowed out. And so there's a, there's a newer wood structure kind of attached to the back of this. Being that it has plumbing and that it is very central in the park and located proximal to the big house, it actually is a very perfect place for a park bathhouse. So it's within the recommended distances from the play areas and swimming areas, while also being conveniently close to the road, because even though it already has water and, and sewer, the likelihood is that we may need to replace that. So we've priced replacing all of the systems at the recommendation of Kenmore, because this is a surprise that, that they encountered later on in their um, both of their park projects, was the need to fully replace infrastructure that they thought could be reused. So we've included that in the pricing. If we get a surprise that says we can keep it, great. If we have to put in new, the distance between the garage and the street where the mains are is actually relatively short, much shorter than it would be if we located the bathhouse where the lake house is or the lakefront structure is. So there were a number of things that came into the discussion about how these things could work together, satisfy some of the, the desired outcomes shared by both the community and both the council, and then how they could play out in the structures. Now, what we realized about the capacity of the larger house is that whatever the posted occupancy of that is, is going to have some bearing on what the size of the restroom needs to be. And whatever the recommended carrying capacity of the rest of the park improvements needs to be, will determine things like the bathroom size. And then both of those things, the structure plus the bathroom, will determine how many of these ADA spaces we're required to have. Now we know based on early examination, we won't be required to have more than five, which is why the designs show five. We also got a lot of comments that said, why do you have five? Make two of these regular spaces. We may get to if we find out that we are only required to have three ADA spaces. But for now, we're planning for, you know, what's what's the maximum. And so that's what's shown in the drawing. Now, the programming in the interior of the big house, there are currently are two stories. And from our tour of the big house, we remembered that, you know, the, the lower story is kind of shorter. Having just a few people in there makes it feel full. And there is a second story that has lots of dormers, lots of tiny rooms, lots of little hallways. And um, looking at early coordination between the structural, the architect, and then really what it would take to make this an accessible structure for all. It would require, could require a lift, could require, you know, excessive ramps. And so what became the um, way to get a good accessible space that held the most people was to remove the second story entirely. And so in terms of the recommendations that we made to, and this is the interior second story, which would then allow the ceiling to be vaulted kind of around the central fireplace that's there. And then the architect mentioned the idea of because we wanna do as much salvage and reuse of materials that are coming out of the other structures, we could actually piece out the old timber from the existing carport and use that to not structurally reinforce the ceiling, but to panel it so that we would have this beautiful old growth, you know, mined from this park, uh, touch of extravagance on the inside of this house. And part of that will be taking out the second story. So it seems like in going through these exercises, the cost of maintaining the second story in either a not accessible way or making it accessible was way over the cost brackets that we had been given for the total cost of this park and would require loss of some of the other park amenities. And so that's why in that, you know, we're not gonna bring you things that aren't feasible. The options that we brought all included uh, you know, removing the second story, and then we're just modulations on the interior of the structure. So being that the community would not be saying, we want occupancy of 75, or we want occupancy of 125, we need a catering kitchen, or we need a simple kitchen. Those are really, that's based on, you know, the council and the city's intended operation of this facility. So we didn't bring those choices to the community for their input. 
what we relied on again was their support of this being a community structure that would serve the people of Lake Forest Park in a flexible capacity. So I'm happy to speak more on that if you have any other questions, mm -hmm. um, but I'll pause and let you guys absorb that. But that, that was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Council member. Council member for Tony. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Ms. Ayers, for as always a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is about timelines. Um, I know at one point there was a timeline shown where um, construction could begin as soon as 2026. Mm -hmm. is that, is, is, are we still on that kind of schedule? So, yes. So right now we haven't had any gaps in you know, the project moving forward. And so that's really where that would cause, you know, an issue. So we know that we don't have enough funding to support the process and the construction currently. And so there may be a gap where we say we need, you know, six months, we need 18 months to fundraise for this project, and then we'll push it forward. So the current timeline assumes no gaps. It assumes that as those initial, as those next phases are starting, they're funded and we're sort of rolling forward. The reason that we're in a 2026, uh, soonest for construction is that we're assuming a 12 month review period for the core permitting, which um, again, so the structures, the current dock that's on the Turner property, the new acquisition is condemned. So it would be an attractive nuisance if the park were to open. So before the park opens, we would need to take that out and just the action of removing that dock if we do nothing else requires core permitting. So no matter what, we are in a federal core permitting situation mm -hmm. with a 12 month window. So we also need the construction, especially the construction of the waterfront, to align with the in-water work window that's acceptable from Fish and Wildlife, and that is July to September. Mm -hmm. So in order to have permits submitted to make a 12-month work window and to have the in-water work align within a construction timeline, it puts us in 2026. Um, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Complicated. Colleagues, <clears throat> uh, any other questions? Deputy Mayor Bodie. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say as uh, someone who's uh, been listening in or sitting in on all the meetings of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and looking at all the work as it progresses, I wanted to thank both the board and its members because I think they just did a fabulous and thoughtful job. And I want to thank um, uh, your group uh, for doing a really excellent job listening to the community and putting out, giving us options and then taking us through with, with really good information to make decisions. So I feel, um, I feel like we're, we're well positioned at this point and, um, and how great is that? So I wanted to thank you all. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> Council Member Lebo. Um, this is sort of a question that represents my um, lack of knowledge entirely of the site. Is there a bulkhead on the north side of the property? And if so, on whose property it is? Yes. So there is um, on this uh, figure here. So essentially where the old dock is on the Turner property, there is a small area of bulkhead that is facing the lake that supports the entrance to the bulk or to the dock. So that in these plans would come out. Okay. There is a long bulkhead yeah. that is on the uh, property line, basically the north property line. Well, because this is a diagonal site, it's sort of the east north side, right? <laughs> it's the <laughs> um, top one. Right. And so the history of this site from a, a you know geomorphology standpoint is that this whole thing would have been underwater. Would have been lake bottom, mm -hmm. then the lake was lowered, mm -hmm. and they, you know, constructed all sorts of things and filled these. Mm -hmm. That is an extensive, you know, parallel armoring to the earth that's holding the site in, mm -hmm. and then also to the property owner on the north. So there are definitely reasons why, from an ecological standpoint, if we were trying to bring the lake back to its, you know, its healthiest, earliest we would take out the locks. That's not gonna happen. If we were trying to restore the shoreline to something closer to that, removal of that bulkhead could be something that we pursue. However, that would dramatically compromise the area of land that's there and could have impacts to the North property owner that would not be desirable in terms of um, you know, what happens at this site. So I do think that from this perspective of what we're looking at on this park, because of the desire to open a public beach to keep the cost low and to provide as much recreation as we could, then maintaining that bulkhead is the is the path that we've gone 
through now. Um, where that falls on the property line is very interesting. Basically, there is an existing CMU wall that is uh, built with its face on the property line. And so the wall itself is on the neighboring property. The face of the wall is on the park property. That comes down and is collinear with the bulkhead wall, but the bulkhead wall is on the adjacent side. And so I think the ownership of that wall, who constructed it in the first place, likely it was this property. I don't know when that happened. It seems to be in good shape. And based on the assessment of our marine engineer, uh, marine structural engineer, who's also on the team, uh, the recommendation was to leave it and then it had a decent functional life left. So part of the question is, um, is the Army Corps of Engineers going to take a slightly different perspective of that bulkhead? Well, I think that's entirely possible, you know, that we don't know what their comment may be. And their recommendation may be, if you're going to go this far, why don't you take this out too? Right. And again, can they compel you to take it out? No. They can, though, prohibit you from repairing it or from replacing it if it were to fail. And so what is proposed in that area, you can see from these plans, is extensive native planting, extensive buffer planting. And what we're seeing and what we're doing on more shorelines where we have a bulkhead that will remain is taking the course of um, potential, potential planned obsolescence. Concrete bulkheads don't last forever. They either fail or they become obsolete. And so when this one fails or becomes obsolete, it may be 30 years, it may be 60 years. Um, and what we will have done is step, not put new investment right on top of it. We will have stepped back, you know, the uses in the park as um, what's, you know, currently there, there's a cabin that comes a little bit closer to it, closer to the edge of that wall. Um, we'll have put in native plants. We'll have tried to do as much as we can to put in things that as, uh, you know, lake water intrudes, if that bulkhead starts to give way, are we still going to be left with uh, a park, a usable beach? And the hope would be yes. You know, 50, 60 years from now, there's a lot of things that can happen climatically, environmentally, but the goal would be that the action that we're taking now would not be something where that investment would be lost if that wall eventually is not allowed to be fixed or replaced. So for example, um, some of the early discussions we had talked about things like, is that the area that serves kayaks? Is, do, is there a kayak locker? Is there a kayak concession? Maybe that's where the a picnic shelter goes. That would be putting investment where we may not be able to protect it in the long-term. And the life of the investments that we're you know, working with the city to make, we would wanna make sure are protected as to the extent that we can forecast at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up on the, um... The Army Corps is always very interested in the dock area. And so if you remove the docks, will they allow you to put them back? So we've done extensive permitting feasibility and permitting review with both our marine engineer that does dock installation, you know, does dock design new docks. And then with our permitting uh, expert who does permitting all around the lake. And so what we are doing here is what's called a dock consolidation. So basically by saying that we have two existing docks, neither of which serve the new purpose. Right. And by giving those up, we are then doing something that is a very good mitigation for adding a new dock that will actually better serve the park and can be built to today's standards. So the current dock on the preserved property is starting to lean because of those encroaching birches. Um, it also is constructed in a way that we don't necessarily construct docks now. It's got more pilings than modern docks need. The surfacing doesn't allow light to pass through. And then it is very close to the mouth of Lion Creek, which by its nature wants to move around and move sediment and needs room to, to breathe and do its thing. So by consolidating the docks, we're moving 40 feet away from the mouth of Lion Creek, which is great room. Um, you know, more is always better, but that's a notable improvement on the amount of space that the, the mouth has. The dock on the turning, Turner property has that armoring that supports it. It's also built to very old standards. Don't build things like that anymore. And it is actually, uh, it, it enters on a shoreline wetland that's present on the, the edge of Lake Washington. So by doing the dock consolidation, we're actually removing the armoring restoring the wetland, removing the dock from that wetland, and then consolidating to a location that's not in wetland and isn't proximal to the mouth of the creek. So we're hoping that all of those strategies together, that the Corps will see this as a win-win and will support this as a reasonable development for a public park. Docks are built all the time. And so it's about the approach. And we think we have a sound strategy for getting it approved by the Corps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, other questions for Member? Great. Well, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thanks. Corey, thanks for all your efforts on all of our behalf. Okay.
sure appreciate the work that the Parks and Rec Board has done as well. So look forward to seeing the next steps. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, there's more slides. Sorry about that. Um, okay. <clears throat> to close out the presentation, um, the uh, next steps after this, thank you for reminding me, Mayor, um, are to finish the alternatives analysis, select the uh, preferred design, which we're aiming for the target of the end of this month. So you will have the design team at the Committee of the Whole meeting on March 25th. Um, then we know that there's a council meeting on the 28th where we're hoping that we'll be ready to adopt a resolution that we can then push forward for preferred design. So our next steps is to um, take the preferred design, do a schematic design package. So that'll mean advancing the design based on the recommendations that we got, the preferred design that was selected, um, preparing some schematic design concepts, and then updating the permitting outlook to show just the preferred design and to do a risk analysis. So one of these things of they may not approve it definitely appears on the risk analysis, which was that tiny type document that I went through really fast. Um, we'll also update the cost. So we'll understand what the design will cost and how much money we should be asking for when we're targeting funding. So one of the wonderful things that I've seen happen in just the last several weeks is because we now have this, um, we know what we're probably going to be including, and we know about how much that's going to cost. Um, the city staff has really like mobilized to target numerous grant applications already outside of RCO that we've been providing information for them to, um, to put forward. So that's been wonderful to see that that funding assessment that was asked about at the prior council meeting is starting to shape, shape and forming. And we have, um, I think, uh, two outside of the RCO deadline that we're applying for already. And then we've pulled together a handful of others that we'll be targeting. So May 1st is that critical RCO funding application deadline. This is 2023, should say 2024. It is a every two years, it's an odd year application deadline. So if we don't make the deadline this year, we wait until 2026 and that pushes the schedule much farther out. So um, May 9th, there is a city council working session. We'll be presenting to you the schematic design package. That's our goal um, it, for that day. And then May 27th is when we'll actually be delivering the schematic design package, which would include any feedback or comments that we receive from the council at the working session on the 9th. So this is the end of our current phase one contract. When we start, when we set out to um, provide a scope for this work, it was we don't know what we're doing in terms of the design. So we can't provide costs for design plans and permitting till we know what we're doing. So let's work through this process. So now that we know what we're doing, as soon as we pull together that preferred design, all of that information goes back out to our consultants and they'll be providing scopes for phase two, which will be part of the schematic design package that's delivered to the council in late May. So simultaneous to this, there is that early works demolition. So early works demolition is the uh, required for the grant funding demolition that was that needs to happen. That funding expires on the uh, 30th of November this year. So outside of the design work that would continue to get done, um, we're working with the city to come up with a uh, package to selectively demolish. So this includes salvaging things that we want to reuse, such as some of the old growth wood, fixtures, you know, doors, whatever we decide is reusable. Brick is one that we want to use throughout the site. Um, the plan currently is to take that out of the structures, to piece it out, store it in the garage that's going to stay until phase two when we do the work to turn it into a bathroom, and then to re-secure the site. So basically the carport is part of the securing of the front of this property. There's the long gate and then the carport. Once that carport is demolished, which is again required by the end of November in order for the city to take advantage of the quarter million dollars that RCO has given for that, um, that carport needs to come down and then it, a gate will have to go back up. So thinking ahead to how this project could be phased and the need for safe crossing to be part of that, um, we do intend to secure the site something like, you know, six to eight feet off of the right of way to allow that right of way work to happen if that can be one of those pieces that's funded early and started and going so that that way we don't have to then, we're not paying for a fence that's going to be moved when we start the next part of the work. So um, we are hoping for uh, notice to proceed soon on that scope. Our goal is to move pretty quick. This is all local permitting. None of this has to go to the state or to the, the feds for permitting this part. So we have already been having conversations with the city administration about permitting of this, what that permitting window might look like. So we're targeting a, a submittal for local permit in May. And then um, the rest of this calendar follows as working back from how much time is needed uh, to make sure that we don't lose this money that the city has already received um, and make sure that it's completed by the end of November. So the next steps for the full park design 
Again, uh, the council will be receiving scopes and proposals for the phase two design work for the rest of the park. Um, conveniently, the cost of the park will be reduced by the cost of the demolition and the cost of the money already spent. So that's good. Um, so that will make the uh, work to complete phase two a little more streamlined in terms of having the demolition and some of that early site prep already completed. So um, we will be looking at development and permit submittal. The goal to make that 2026 window is to submit early for core permitting, which will be the 30% design set. So what needs to go to the core is part of the project. They won't need to see things like the building permits for the big house. And so it'll be a staged permitting to put in front of the core the information that they need, and then to continue moving forward with everyone, everything else for those local permit, um, local permit timelines. So roundabout, we are hoping for that uh, the DD scope to the city um, on May 27th, uh, hopefully council approval um, in June, and then the submittal of permits, we're targeting September 2024. So that would be the 30% design to move uh, permits ahead. And then following that, um, we would anticipate that construction documentation and permitting review would be that September to December of, the, of 2025. And then um, bid support and coordination would follow. Construction, again, targeting that April to September window. And then uh, post-occupancy site commissioning is just, you know, what's working, what's not, what additional help do you need from us being the subsequent year? So that is the actual end of my presentation. Thanks <laughs> for, <laughs> for all of that. If there's any additional questions, just let me know. Colleagues, questions on the, on the timeline? Very informative. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, um, well, we had four presentations there in a row. Uh, I would entertain a motion for adoption of the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, okay. Are there any nays? The ayes have it, it passes unanimously. Thank you, council. Uh, let's see, and we are on to ordinances and resolution for <clears throat> introduction and referral. Uh, Director Hoffman is, I believe, next. Resolution 24-1946, authorizing the mayor to accept the Department of Commerce Climate Planting Planning Grant. Excuse me. Welcome back. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director. There's a lot of related background that I think I should leave to questions that you may have. The resolution is very straightforward. We've been awarded $500,000 to complete a scope of work related to new legislation requiring a climate element. Uh, the background that I have is how that came about and how it's not mm -hmm. a periodic update for the House Bill 1110 Development Code regulations. So uh, I'll assume that you have some background. I can fill you in on its relation to that. Uh, packets, uh, packet materials include the cover letter for the summary, includes the draft resolution, this is an introduction of that resolution. Uh, it also includes the interagency agreement sent to us by Commerce. I'm aware of one amendment, and we may have some comments tonight about provisions in the contract. Um, the, the one amendment that I would mention from staff are the dates of the scope. It's been quite some time since the grant application, and we've talked with Commerce staff very recently, and they are amenable to date changes that reflect a March start, since it is now March. Any provisions uh, or issues to the uh, sections in the agreement would need to go through what they refer to as central contracting, which could take some time. But I'm open to feedback on those tonight, as you find necessary. I'll provide that input to Commerce as soon as tomorrow. But this is the introduction tonight. and. We are proposing two touches since it is a grant opportunity and could return on March 28th if everything goes according to plan. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hoffman. Colleagues, questions for Mark? Uh, Council Member Fertoni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Hoffman, for a succinct uh, report on what's going on with this uh, grant. Um, first of all, kudos to, uh, to you and your staff for securing the grant. Um, my question is about the uh, um, the climate. Uh, what's it called? The climate policy advisory team. That's uh, one of the thing, first things that needs to be formed. Who do you see uh, um, being on this team? The uh, the timeline runs 
under the grant and the deliverables through June of 2025. The Planning Commission would do the amendment to the comprehensive plan. We began that conversation on Monday. So while they play that role through docketing next year, and their recommendation would then go to city council, presumably in the second half of that year. Uh, I see them having a role on that advisory uh, committee. That I also think there's nobody better versed to these policies than the Climate Action Committee who just went through this process with the Climate Action Plan. But I don't see the Climate Action Committee as the entire committee or commission uh, advisory uh, come in. Um, but I imagine that if, depending on the feedback tonight, if we were to proceed, one of the items we could produce in March before we have a, a signed agreement uh, authorized is uh, feedback and formation of that advisory group. If the core of that were the Climate Action Committee and it contained, for instance, two representatives from Planning Commission, maybe City Council or any other groups, that that core advisory group would work together through 2024, definitely through 2025, and then could be available to present it to city council in beginning in June of 2025. And that's the advantage of having uh, a, a uh, one or two council members on the committee. Um, having seen that whole process, they could advise uh, their fellow council members. Thank you. And just as a quick follow up. Yeah, um, this is because the uh, deadline for the climate element uh, portion of the of the uh, um, comp plan is December 2025. That's correct. The, the actual deadline for city of Lake Forest Park and cities and, and King County is 2029. Uh, the the uh, House Bill 1181 came about during a time when uh, King uh, the four counties around uh, metropolitan Seattle were already underway in their periodic update. Then House Bill 1110 came with some uh, significant housing demand. So the legislature said that for Snohomish, King, Kitsap, and Pierce, the deadline is 2029 at a new five-year check-in, but that grants would be prioritized for cities and counties that had a period periodic update due in 2025. That grant funding did not run out. And so it was made available to other jurisdictions, including King County. Lake Forest Park was six, uh, fortunately successful. That moves the grant deliverable to June, 2025. The way we have the scope uh, written is not adoption of a climate element, but the creation of a review draft. That would free up the second part of 2025 after the grant deliverables for consideration by the council. In either event, that's years sooner than the actual RCW mandate. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question looking at the elements of the scope of work. Um, there's a, there's a, emphasis almost exclusively, it seems, on greenhouse gas emissions. And one of my concerns is that climate change and climate action is broader. And that, that's one of my objections to some of the legislative proposals I see or some of the policies I see. They're just completely focused on greenhouse gas emissions. And so I'm interested in um, how we could integrate concepts of thermal impacts and also, the as we learned from the iTree report um, at our last council meeting, the value of the tree canopy in removing um, uh, CO2 from uh, on an annual basis and over time from, from um, our city. Uh, so I, I'm just somewhat worried about, we may have a broader view, but would Department of Commerce, because we're getting signing the grant with them, have a narrower view and focus, uh, not not be able to consider the broader issues of the tree canopy and heat effects. I I, I don't think they would have a, a narrow narrower view and prohibit that work, but their goal is to achieve the fourteenth goal of the Growth Management Act. And in so doing, require this climate element of uh, cities and counties. 
and then create the greenhouse gas emission sub-element and the resiliency sub-element, which is reflective of the legislation. To offset that burden, they provided funding. The funding needs to be specific to that. I don't think there's anything that says we can't do more than that, but it would not be part of this grant funding. There may be some crossover in those regards with the Climate Action Plan through May. Uh, the Planning Commission is aware of that. The goal in 2024 is to incorporate the Climate Action Plan into the periodic update to the extent that it is available by May when they make their recommendation and contains items like that. It concerns me that uh, uh, we could not use these grant funds to sandwich in those other connected elements to greenhouse gas emissions, namely the uh, carbon reduction value of the tree canopy and the um, and the heat impacts, because I think that's where uh, retaining trees uh, versus creating a lot more impervious surfaces without trees um, comes into play. So if possible, I would like us to at least as sub elements um, to the greenhouse gas emissions, which I understand is the driver, to be able to see if we could shoehorn in now some of those understandings. So we could use this obviously generous grant um, to help us look at a, a, a broader view, all channeling in to their focus on greenhouse gas emissions. So if we could, if we could even have some, you know, general enough language to uh, to uh, hang our hat on so that we could use this grant for those connected elements as well. Not that they would become, um, you know, half the funding or anything like that, the greenhouse gas emissions. I understand why you're saying that's the umbrella, but can we tuck a few things in under the umbrella? I think, I think the opportunity is there and the moment would be uh, uh, if we RFQ, and have an RFQ reflective of this grant, uh, scope, scope of work in the budget to fund that scope. Then the opportunity is to analyze those, see if they fit under that umbrella. And if they don't, we could still do them in that contract with the consultant. I want to use this grant money for that work mm -hmm. and see if we can just, I'm, I'm, I know we're, we're talking a little bit past each other, but I am asking us to see if we can tuck some of these elements, just, you know, a reference in the scope of work to the value of, uh, you know, vegetation and trees to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and um, the element connected to heat, because if you cut down a bunch of trees, and build apartment buildings without parking to lower greenhouse gas emissions, you may actually not have an, a big net benefit um, because the trees are providing great value. So uh, I, I, I'd like us to try to make sure that the grant language allows us to look at those, not that we could hook on other money to, uh, to this grant. I, I, staff certainly not opposed. If we were to get a written description, I'm sorry, May. No, no, I was just going to say, I think um, Attorney Pratt has something to interject here and it might help our conversation. Kim, welcome. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood Council Member Bodie and see if that's what Council's asking is that you're asking specifically to revise the scope of work that is in the draft grant. Yes, and asking that the element, the umbrella of greenhouse gas emissions in its description, such as it may be, includes looking at, uh, at heat and uh, vegetation at, in connection with greenhouse gas emissions. That's, that's what I'm, I'm asking. So at least we colorably can use this grant for those um, subsidiary issues. And I'm only able to see some of you. So uh, at once, is that kind of the consensus of council that we asked to revise the scope with Paul, commerce? Just do any of you have any objections to Deputy Mayor Spody's change and request for change in scope for the grant? Aye. 
Councilmember Lebo first, and then uh, Councilmember Colbin. I, I think it's an interesting idea, and I understand Councilmember Bodie's uh, request. I think, though, that we always have to be careful with regard to grants and the provisions for the award of the grants, and I would not want to push very hard if it jeopardizes or limits our ability to use the grant. And yes, Council I Member am hoping that they would not say no and we'd be subtle. <laughs> Councilmember Goldman was next. Um, yeah, I, I have no objection to asking. Um, I think we might want to be prepared that Commerce might say that the trees are not reducing the emission of greenhouse gases. They are removing the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And so if the goal of this grant is to reduce emissions, then that's going to be looking at vehicles, buildings as the sources. So I'm okay with us politely or politely asking, <laughs> or politely and respectfully asking, <laughs> but I, I think also be prepared that they might say that's not really what the grant is for. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember, good. So the EPA says that greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide. So they have language for carbon dioxide. Colleagues, uh, so if there's no further mm -hmm. objection to Council, De apologies. Deputy Mayor Bodie's request, are we, are you, is it acceptable for you to, yes, Deputy Mayor Bodie. I respect my colleagues' comments. That was, uh, of course, my understanding as well, too. I do not want to lose the grant, but I'd like us to see if we could uh, politely and subtly um, see if we can use grant funds for this connected uh, value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can't hurt to ask, I suppose. I can't hurt to ask. That's okay. <laughs> Colleagues, any further questions for Director Hoffman? Councilmember Lebo. I, I appreciate the uh, comment and question by um, Councilmember Furatani about the um, Climate Policy Advisory Team. And I would like us to consider and asking if the administration would progress that. I think there would be advantageous for us to move on that and a suggestion that it be composed of members of the Planning Commission and the Climate Action Group. I think though that the role that the council should play is one of liaisons and not as members of the climate policy team. Colleagues, other comments on that question before I can weigh in a little bit? Council Member for Tony. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councilmember Lebo, for that suggestion. I think it's a great one. I think that uh, um, we're going to have, as council, enough say on it as it is. So getting literally the people who have been working the front lines on this problem, uh, thinking about how we're going to incorporate the climate element would be ideal. So I agree with you. Yeah, thank you, council members. And, and on point, I, I believe that um, let's let the, the best people do the work. And as you indicated, I believe that you all will have plenty of time to to be looking at this. Um, and again, it really depends on uh, how this progresses, but I think that there's an opportunity there for, um, you know, I think it's it's additive rather than, than um, I think there's a good opportunity there. So I'm not stating it very very well. <laughs> really well. <laughs> Any other qu uh, comments on, on point or questions for Director Hoffman? One, one more, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just thinking in terms of timing, there was this possible suggestion of coming back maybe on March 28th and talking about a uh, composition of a climate policy advisory team. And I would just encourage that if that's at all feasible. And I think that there would be a preponderance sure. of uh, members from the climate action group. Sure. And, I, and from my perspective of the administration, I would say it is really the will of this body what you would like to do, Mr. Lebo. So in terms of the, the general makeup, as, you, as it were. Yeah, so I guess part of uh, my, my question really is to my colleagues Here you are. as to whether that's a reasonable approach. Can you, can you restate what you're proposing? So I, I was encouraging, I heard from Mr. Hoffman, that Director Hoffman, that it might be possible to come back on the 28th and suggest a possible makeup of a climate policy advisory team, mm -hmm. not necessarily the actual members, but maybe a composition of the planning commission in terms of members, sure. number of members and number of members from a climate action group, and that that be something that we could sure. then move forward with. Thank you. I, I do support that. Any other comments on point? Okay. I think we're good. Thank you very much, Thank Director you. Hoffman. 
Uh, let's see. We are moving on to Ordinance 24-1290, amending the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code 10.060.030 related to traffic to automatic traffic safety cameras. This is... Yes, may I address the mayor and council for a second? Uh, you've missed public comment, Mr. Kiefer. I'm sorry. Uh, it was the a... agenda said seven o'clock. I get here and it's already occurring. I wasn't aware of the change. So what I'd like to ask is your uh, consideration to let me make my public comment. Mr. Kiefer, we've never Maybe done the end. We have never done that in the past. I'm very sorry. You changed. It is posted on line at and six o'clock. I didn't. I have your document here. It says start at seven o'clock. So I asked for leave to make my public comment. May I ask the clerk if this was posted accurately? It was posted accurately. There was a typo on the call to order that says seven. But it was posted accurately. In chambers. In chambers. Thank you, Mr. McLean. So it was it was posted online and it was posted uh and as required by state statute well in the alternative since you won't let me speak will you at least accept my written comments we'd be happy to who do i give them to you may hand them to me Okay, moving on. The we were on ordinance 12, 24 1290. And um this actually I will I will rely on Ms. Pratt here for part of this. But council, this is basically a housekeeping measure to reflect the um <clears throat> the, necess the necessity for tightening up our code as it pertains to additional traffic camera. Uh, installations potentially in the future as provided under state statutes that were passed uh, went into effect last year in July 1st of 2023. Um, and I'm, I'm going to leave it to you, Ms. Pratt. <laughs> sure. If you don't mind, please. No, no problem. So um, state statute allows the uh, traffic camera infractions to be proved by showing which the vehicle, which vehicle did the infraction, and then um, showing who the registered owner is. In our LFP code, we um, specified that that was for stoplight infractions um, and the school zone infractions. And so this cleans that up. And so it, it would just be that presumption um, the way we prove traffic infractions would be used for any traffic camera infraction in LFP, wherever, whatever cameras uh, council decides to put in that are allowed by state statute. Thank you, Ms. Pratt. I appreciate that. I was just catching my breath here for a second. Um, and again, council, this was something that came up actually as legislation was passing uh, through the House and the Senate relative to traffic cameras. And I wanted to make sure that we considered uh, that we had all, all our bases covered when it came to the future. So this is basically a housekeeping measure. And um, are there any questions? I'd be happy to answer or Ms. Pratt would. Mr. Goldman. Um, yes, thanks. And um, no objections to what's in this, but as you alluded to, um, a bill very recently, I think earlier this week passed the legislature. It's a House Bill 2384. And it seems like it makes fairly substantial changes to traffic camera rules. Uh, I tried to read it. I got very confused. <laughs> and so I wonder if it would be more efficient for us to see what the changes from House Bill 2384 are, and then potentially roll these changes into those and have sort of one more comprehensive overhaul of our traffic camera ordinance. Thank you, Councilmember Goldman. That was a... Um piece of legislation that some of us were following um, probably too closely. And uh, and the various iterations, if you looked at the, the number of amendments that were listed before it finally passed uh, concurrence in the House the other day is quite staggering. Regrettably, <clears throat> the ordinance is pretty convoluted. Uh, the legislation is pretty convoluted and it's fa fairly challenging in terms of the way it's written. 
however it is beneficial to our community. That is something I considered as well. Um, I am not sure, and I don't know whether Ms. Pratt is, has been versed in 2384 um, as it was um, finally concurred in the House. Uh, and it is not, it's, going, it's gone to the, uh, the governor's desk. I'm not sure whether that would impact this particular particular section of our code or not, but I'm, we're going to be bringing this back for additional touches. So we can certainly look into that and see what how it would affect it, because uh, it's definitely top of mind for me. Larry, Ms. Pratt, do you have anything to add to that? I have not looked at the final version of that bill. I'm happy to do that and see if it would make sense for us to wait and adopt one thing you know, adopt changes all at once, but I'm sorry, I haven't looked at the final version yet. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I can talk a little bit more that, more about that legislation in at the end of our conversation today. Okay, any other questions on, on this topic? Now we can move on. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we're going to item number eight, ordinances and resolutions for council discussion. Um, Clerk McLean has this. Matt's Ordinance 24, 1289, amending the 2023 2024 budgeted positions and salary schedule for the Municipal Services Department. And this is related to passport, addition of passport uh, staff member. Uh, yes. Um, this was presented at the February 18th Budget and <clears throat> Finance Committee. Um, the Budget and Finance Committee recommended hiring an additional 0.5 part-time passport clerk. Um, so I raised our my passport clerks or the city's passport clerks from one FTE to 1.5 FTE. Basically, um, it would generate one part-time passport clerk would generate about 110,000 in revenue, um, cost about 34,000 to have for salary and benefits and leaving about 75,000 in revenue. So here to answer any questions. Hey, Calgary, excuse me, colleagues, any questions for Mr. McLean? Councilmember Fertani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Th th thank you, uh, um, Clerk McLean, for um, laying out such a great business case for why we should hire this. And uh, I think the lack of comments on our part don't, don't reflect anything about basically this position, but what I do want to basically thank you for your hard work and research and convincing us of this. Thank you, council member. Alex, any more <laughs> questions? Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. Excellent work. Uh, uh, and that we, takes us to other business. Yeah. Are there any other items of business? Um, is this a, just, just a point of order? Um, this was under for council discussion. So, would this be appropriate to move on this? Was there any urgency on this particular the previous ordinance we were discussing? I don't think that staff would say no. Okay, if you chose to accelerate the time frame. All right, then uh, I propose to uh, waive the three touch rule on ordinance 24 1289, amending the 2023 24 budgeted positions and salary schedule for municipal services department. Second. Ordinance 2024 1289 has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Councilmember for Tony. Uh, of course, I'm speaking in favor of my motion, but uh, <laughs> the, the reason is that I usually don't like waiving the three touch rule, but it does seem that this is fairly non controversial. That, in fact, uh, um, the benefits could accrue to the city more quickly if we move on it now. So there, I don't see any reason to hesitate on it. Thank you, Councilmember. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor of passage of ordinance? Three touch rule waive. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. All those in favor of waiving the three-touch rule, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, Council. And then I will formally move to uh, move Ordinance 24-1289, amending the 2023-24 budget of positions and salary schedule for the Municipal Services Department. Second. Ordinance 24-1289 has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion, Council? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you very much, colleagues. Congratulations, Matt. Thank you, Council.
All right. So with that, we're moving on to other business. Is there other other business? Uh, Deputy Ramoti. Uh, I wanted to let my colleagues on the council know that uh, I had planned to stay as liaison to the Parks and Recreation Board through the submission of their recommendation for the design of the park. And so uh, after one more meeting of the Parks Board, where I'm going to thank the Parks Board for their work, uh, I'll be stepping away uh, as liaison. And so there will be an opening if, uh, if any of my colleagues are interested in serving as liaison to the Parks Board. I will say it's a great group and uh, they're very interested in um, activities that get uh, our local citizens in our parks and, uh, and, and they're also interested in partnerships, for example, with the uh, with Shore Lake Arts, uh, so I I really think they're fun to work with. They're also interested in the whole topic of um, being able to accept donations as we move forward with the Lakefront Park or honestly any of our park properties. So that's a topic they've long term been interested in. So I I encourage you to consider it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, Okay. Yeah. Don't have to answer now, but you can let, um, think about it. Think about it a little bit and maybe ask uh, Deputy Rabodi some questions, reach out, and see what yeah. it's like. So right. thank you thank for you. your service, Deputy Rabodi. If uh, provided excellent leadership there. Um, let's see. We're on to council committee reports. Let's start with council member reports. Uh, start with Mr. Colton. Um, yeah, in the past week, I attended two meetings. Uh, yesterday was the tree board meeting. Uh, they approved their work plan. Um, I know they, they were with us pre, uh, at our previous meeting talking about the uh, tree inventory report. I imagine they'll give a brief uh, update on their work plan. Um, and then they spent much of, uh, of the evening talking about public outreach. Um, they're going to be having an Arbor Day event on Saturday, April, I want to say 27th. Um, if that's the Saturday. Um, also, they'll be participating in the Green Fair, which will be in uh, Third Place Commons at the end of this month. And then just going over what sort of outreach in terms of like a pamphlet that they can have at the Tree Fair um, to let people know what the tree board is and, and some information about tree preservation. The Ivy, I think I mentioned this at a previous council meeting, I, it'll be an Ivy removal demonstration for the Arbor Day event. Um, in order for us to keep our Tree City USA accreditation, we'd have to have an Arbor Day event each year. So this will be our official Arbor Day event. And then last week was Seashore. Um, it was a relatively short meeting. Uh, we did not vote on uh, moving projects through to the uh, regional uh, PSRC grant process because there weren't enough to vote on. Uh, so they all get approved automatically. Uh, Seattle was the only city to put any forward. Uh, we and Shoreline did not, um, but they went over resources that are available for smaller jurisdictions to kind of overcome the fact that there are not that many staff. Um, we don't have designated staff department or grant writing departments. Um, also, Seashore moving forward will consider approve, uh, writing letters of support if cities are applying for grants for transportation related items. Um, and we bring that information to Seashore at least a month in advance to give Seashore ample time to look it over. They'll consider signing on uh, letters of support. So that's what I've done the last week. Thank you, Council mm -hmm. Member. Council Member Lebo. Uh, thank you for that. Just a, a question. Um, can you broaden the, um, the discussion a little more about grants um, in terms of, is it from PSRC or is it to Seashore or how does uh, that work? So as an example, would they fund traffic studies? Yes, um, this is federal money. Uh, the federal government gives it to the states. The states give it to regional agencies like PSRC. PSRC can then distribute it to cities, counties, transit agencies that apply. What I've heard from staff and city administrator Hill can chime in uh, if he wants to add anything is that federal grants come with a lot of extra strings compared to say state grants. And so it's only re for us, it would only really be suitable for very large projects. Uh, for instance, the uh, Berkelman to city hall connector, uh, but it's PSRC administering federal grant programs. 
Does that answer your question? It does, and I've done projects with PSR that were funded through PSRC, PSRC that were federal grants, and they're kind of like just other grants. They all have strings. <laughs> and so I, I don't know that it was substantively different than any other grant that we worked on. I'm not sure it would be the impediment to ask for money. Okay. Uh, anything else, Mary? Uh, no, I think that covers Seashore. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Fertani. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple of things to report. I attended the K4C Outreach Committee meeting, uh, and uh, the main takeaway from it is, um, unlike the uh, Building Energy Navigator bill that kind of uh, did not pass the legislator this time around, there is a site called uh, wa.switcheson.org, which is literally an energy navigator, how to find contractors for heat pumps, how to basically electrify your home, that kind of stuff. So um, they're really trying to uh, move on this because um, this is kind of a... Um, I think it's a way they're going to get the pilot project out without actually having to go through the whole legislative process. So nevertheless, it's a really great resource for uh, residents in our city. Okay, the second thing is the Climate Action Committee met. And uh, um, like with the uh, Parks Board, we'll be at the, uh, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, what's it called? Green Fair, sorry, on March 30th. Uh, there's also going to be a climate town hall uh, that we're working with the first legislative district uh, legislators. Um, Ken Moore's a co-sponsor on it, and this is going to be on April 13th from 10 to noon. Um, uh, our own Brian Saunders is going to be the moderator, so that'll be interesting. And then finally, um, just because basically this is a, a fun thing, um, Kenmore has a solarized Kenmore uh, um, meeting I think it's at it is at city hall their city hall thursday march 21st and they work with uh, puget sound energy as well as local contractors for people who want to put up um small solar uh, projects also community solar projects so building in some climate resiliency um this might be a model that we're thinking about even though of course we don't work with pse great thank you council member very interesting colleagues other thank you everybody uh, the Planning Commission had a special meeting. In fact, they have many special meetings. If you read your messages on that, they are definitely uh, drinking from the fire hose <laughs> along with our community development director with and with his support. Uh, they worked on the transportation elements. Uh, I will say, speaking for myself personally, when we embarked on this comprehensive planning process, I thought, well, our comprehensive plan's pretty good. We'll just do a few tweaks, you know, in the areas where we have state legislation. But I'm coming to realize that the checklist of elements we need to cover is a lot more comprehensive than for the comprehensive plan. So I think we are going to see quite a significant red line of red line edits of our comprehensive plan when the time comes. Uh, but I really appreciate the hard work that uh, that everyone is uh, putting into it. Our consultants, our staff, and uh, and the planning commissioners themselves, who are having many extra meetings. Uh, the the time we went through the timeline as well. Uh, oh, we they also went through how and to what extent to incorporate climate into the plan considering that the whole climate element won't be till 2025. So uh, so there will be some uh, acknowledgement and improvement of the climate goals, but it will be probably under other headings, for example, land use, uh, environmental quality, transportation. transportation and so forth. And then eventually down the road, the planning commission will present with the part in partnership with the climate action group uh, a whole climate element later uh, in, in the future. So if you hadn't read the materials that closely, I just wanted to lay out that timeline. Um, I, I did uh, encourage the planning commission to when they have a red line draft to help hold their own public hearing first and to, which they have done before uh, and which is very helpful because it, it gives the community an opportunity to look at the whole document before 
it's coming, you know, to the council with all the rules and procedures that the council has. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful that they will do that, and so that when we get the package, it will uh, have reflected the comments from the public hearing as well. So that's about it. Um, there's a lot going on. <laughs> Colleagues, any other council member reports? Okay, I guess we'll go on to my report. A couple of things. Um, council leadership and myself will be joining Jake Johnson, our lobbyist in DC starting Sunday. Um, I'm pleased to hear that a lot of our neighboring cities are going to have representation there as well. We'll be attending the National League of Cities Conference as well as a couple of days on the hill. Um, fortunately, for the first time in, I think, three trips for me, the weather's actually going to be nice. It's not going to be a hur hurricane force winds or blizzards. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And as I mentioned to Councilmember Furtani, wear your walking shoes. It's a lot of hoofing around the, the Capitol. Very much looking forward to that, those conversations. It's always an enjoyable trip, and we haven't done it for a while. Uh, a couple of things, too. We have upcoming meetings. There was a reminder the meeting is canceled. Both meetings are canceled next week. The work session as well as the council meeting. Um, and then the next meeting for uh, some of you or anyone is welcome to attend, of course, budget and finance on the 21st. And to Deputy Mayor Bodie's comments about, uh, we have a very full schedule. Um, if you're going to be considering requesting additional meetings or other kinds of things. Let's start making sure we get those penciled in as soon as possible, because not only does this body have to consider the um, various um, plans that are coming from different um, bodies that are working on things right now, we have the comprehensive plan that's coming down the pike, as well as a budget season that kicks off here in a very short period of time. And there are other, issue, other topics as well that we're going to have to be addressing uh, going forward. Um, just quickly, um, without boring you all to tears, the legislation legislative session uh, went to Cindy today. Yay. It was, um, shall I say, I don't know, how would you characterize it, Mr. Hill? Painful. Yeah. Um, there, there was there was definitively some some a lot of very good work came out of the session that's going to be sitting on the on the governor's desk uh, for his consideration. Um, as Larry mentioned, um, 2384 is one that we were following very, very closely. And part of it was because it would have made some, without going into the gory details, literally gory details, it would have um, created some real, as it was originally written and then amended, would have created some enormous challenges for this community. Fortunately, uh, Senator Elias, who was a sponsor of the bill, was very responsive to our legislative, our lobbyist, uh, who helped uh, craft, as well as Mr. Hill, helped help get some, make sure some amendments went into place. And so the, the takeaways from that bill are cities are going to be allowed and counties are going to be allowed to put speed enforcement cameras on state highways within, or I should say, not counties, cities, cities will be able to traffic safety cameras, speed cameras on state highways within their boundaries, basically subject to certain conditions. There will also be additional opportunities for expansion for school zones and the other zones that we've talked about uh, that would, that passed legislative, the legislature la and went into effect last July 1st. Uh, the fine structure is very specific. Uh, there's a cap on the fine, which is actually higher than what we uh, enforce in our school zone. Um, the bases, but the cap for red lights and for speed infractions will be $145 adjusted for inflation every five years by the Office of Financial Management. Management? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so it's it's going to be a conversation that we're going to be having in the future. Any new camera installations beyond one additional camera, as I understand it, my crude math, uh, going forward, the revenues for that for the first four years will have to be going very specifically to pedestrian and multimodal safety enhancements, which I think is a, a huge win for, for our community. Uh, it means we have a lot of planning to do in that regard. And I think there's some great opportunities here to help um, change some behaviors as well as for the people who are errant and their behavior 
They can help fund our crosswalks and sidewalks. So I think that um, there's a lot to digest in that bill. And if you have any questions, I, um, I'd be happy to answer them at any time. It's very poorly written. So I'm concerned that there may be some challenges uh, because there's contradictory language. Deputy Mirba. Question. Uh, the, um, when we were going through the draft comprehensive plan, one of the things I noticed is the new transportation elements do still reference safe streets and safe highways. And so in light of this legislation, not between now and the end of 2024, <laughs> but we may need to consider a refresh on safe streets uh, because that, especially if we're going to be dedicating potential new revenue to, um, to those improvements. So just uh, a placeholder for that. Uh, I know we have t we have our work cut out for us for when I look ahead to the rest of the this calendar year. Uh, a second question I have for you on the legislative front: mm -hmm. Am I correct in my understanding that the that based on the citizen initiative, the state legislature passed the the changes to police pursuit? They did. Okay, that's correct. So uh, that is, the, the governor hasn't signed it yet, but it, it's been passed out of this session. Yes, I believe it passed uh, roughly 73, 74 to 20, 26. Okay. Um, there was a very robust discussion, some impassioned pleas to not change it, some impassioned pleas to definitively change it. Um, I had a conversation with a citizen earlier today. I don't know what the right answer formula is I do know that something had to change and I think that this is maybe you know this pendulum swinging back and forth a little bit we'll see where it goes um I, I think it, that was uh that was a very po a, a, um productive conversation I, I appreciated hearing the perspectives of the different uh legislators another thing that passed uh out of the house and senate that's on the, uh, the um governor's desk is the issue of supplanting revenue in case of a, of a levy uh, lid lift. Um, that's been outlawed, I believe, since 2000. Mr. Hill, do you remember? It goes way back to, I may even go back to um, 2001. I can't remember, but it was very specific to King County, which basically meant that um, what had happened in the past was that communities who needed additional revenues would pass a, legis uh, a, a levy lid lift, and then they would offer, they would reallocate funds from programs to kind of um, kind of shift things around, if you will. And it really, by taking that opportunity away, uh, and and the local authority for where those revenues were being able to be utilized, really made it extraordinarily difficult. So um, that is a big deal because the rest of the state didn't have that limitation, and that has been removed, subject to the um the governor's signature it, it just levels the playing field and as a community that's is dependent upon very specific revenue streams we need all the help we can get to make sure that our general fund uh can be used allocated the way that the community and the council sees fit um let's see i think i won't bore you with any more details um Mr. Hill, Administrator's Report, anything that you wanted to highlight? Just a couple more bills. House Bill 2088, um, that's the liability protection for our co-responders for RACER. That passed, so that, that was huge. For RACER, um, 2160 was defeated. That was the TOD bill, so we, we live another year without that. We'll see what they do to it next year. Um, and then just back to the traffic camera bill. I mean, so that gives us everything. It gives us um, BAT lanes. Oh, you, Once yes. the BRT is permitted with the city, you can install BAT um, cameras. We have a lot, and officers can speak to that, a lot of people who cut traffic and, and use those for transportation. Um, it also gives us the others that we've talked about before, the park zones, hospital zones. That doesn't apply to us, but it gives you the whole slew as well as the speed cameras. It also takes away the 50% share with the state. So all the revenues flow to the city instead of sharing 50% with the state. So a lot of good work. And um, I was at a meeting yesterday and I, I thank AWC for the work they did. Um, they get a lot of information to Shelly and our team to, and a lot of coordination. So 
while it was a painful and sometimes sleepless <laughs> um, <laughs> going home, not very happy. <laughs> um, in the end, it turned out all right. So I think for overall, we came out pretty good, but who knows what the long session next year will mean. So, yeah, so thank you, go. Mr. Mr. Hill, for the details on that. And, and just on point to uh, Senator Elias, who is from Edmonds. Uh, he's also the chair of the uh, the Senate Transportation Committee. He did an amazing job of shepherding this um, that legislation through some really challenging um, opposition uh, and um, and just just for note, and then I don't want to end on a on a negative note, but he said that the numbers for 20, 2023 for Washington State is up to preliminary numbers are up to eight hundred um fatalities and they've been climbing and climbing and climbing and he set the stage by saying we have i believe over 100 towns in in the state of washington that have less than 800 people pretty sobering and uh we see it day in day out and so um i think that the i think it's very important and this came by the way as at, at the recommendation of the transportation committee uh so uh, they were the ones that that recommended this come uh, to the legislature. I'm glad it passed. I believe very strongly that um, there may be some refinement next year that may not be as positive for us. So I will just give you all a heads up that I'm hoping that despite our workload, we're going to be able to do some modest um, consideration of of what we need to do sooner rather than later before we have some um, a tragedy. So. Uh, are there any other? Oh, I did want to end on a positive note. Um, we got a really wonderful letter you all saw from the owner of the Cushery. Many thanks mm -hmm. to the PD for their response twice to to the incidents that ha happened there. And despite the incidents, the owner uh, was singing the praises of our PD. So thank you, Sergeant Adman Adams, to you and your team. It's the it's testament to the department. With that, is there anything else for the good of the order? I, the last thing I want to say is many thanks to my little one who's sitting so quietly in the back of the room. Future council member. All right, y'all. <laughs> We're adjourned. She can't hear you.